My name is Indy Nidell, and this is another exciting episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer all of your questions about the First World War. Matthew writes, uh, Hello, Indy and the Great War team. With the advent of these complex mazes of barbed wire, how effective were the flamethrowers to reach over the barbed wire and into the trenches? Or were they simply no man's land weapons? Perhaps a separate episode on flamethrowers could be possible as well. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, that could be possible, maybe. Think about it. Good idea. Um, there were as you may guess, smaller and larger versions of the flamethrower. Richard Fiedler, who was the pioneer of the German Flammenwerfer, uh, he had developed it prior to the war, a smaller version that a single soldier could carry into battle. And it had a range of like 18 meters or so, that's about 20 yards. Uh, the bigger version had to be operated by a team of soldiers, but could fire about 40 meters in length, so over twice that distance. And yeah, it is at least theoretically possible to engulf everything up to 40 meters with burning oil. Um, their use in combat was limited since they were quite heavy and cumbersome to wield. The bigger version, the Glossflammenwerfer, uh, could sustain about 45 seconds of blazing flames. But then its tank was empty, so it was more of a quick operational weapon um, used in the first phases of an assault to clear out dugouts or machine gun nests, things like that. Like their first use at Hooge in July 1915, when the Germans stormed into the British trenches with blazing flamethrowers, causing a widespread panic and, of course, agonizing deaths. It wasn't really useful in no man's land, as I mentioned. It was quite a big weapon, and once ablaze, it gave away the position of the operator. I mean, you were just like a matchstick, you know? And, and it became an important target for every rifle in reach, and you're all lit up once you're using it. Uh, it is kind of a rumor, like with the use of shotguns, that uh, people operating um, flamethrowers would not be shown mercy if they got caught by an enemy. But I didn't find any hard evidence on that. You can write in if you have some. Uh, now, later they would be used by German defenders to fight tanks. And if they actually managed to get in reach of a petroleum-powered, oil-stained machine like a tank, then they were deadly effective. Uh, Thomas Mazurek writes, Hello, Indy. Great show. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I was wondering how much of a direct threat planes and airships posed to the troops on the ground. I mean direct, aside from serving as spotters for the artillery, okay. Uh, was strafing or bombing the ground troops a regular occurrence, or was it still more of an experimental form of combat that was not practiced often? Also, did ground troops have any specialized form of anti-aircraft weapons? Airships usually flew way too high for them to bomb anything bigger than a town or train station with any precision. Well, at least as precise as throwing bombs out of an airship flying up to 20,000 feet high could be. Fighter planes, on the other hand, they did indeed attack troops on the ground with their machine guns, uh, especially in the later stages of the war. Allied planes would swoop down on the unprepared and disorganized retreating German and Austrian troops and shot at them with their machine guns. But shooting down an airplane from the ground wasn't actually that difficult if they flew low enough and within reach of the defenders' guns. The first anti-air tactics were pretty simple. They, they gathered enough soldiers in a small place, one usually equipped with binoculars, and, and they waited for the plane to get into reach. Then all rifles and all machine guns would open up at once. The first cannon that shot down a plane was during the Serbian campaign in 1915, as one very lucky Serbian gunner uh, shot one down with his regular field gun. Um, later on, the warring nations would, of course, modify their old calibers into specialized anti-aircraft guns like the 12 and 13 pounders of the British or the German 7.7 .7 centimeter guns. And they would equip them with high explosive rounds and airburst fuses. Now, aiming these guns was pretty difficult since you had to measure the right height for the airburst fuses to go off at the right time, and only in the late stage of the war did both sides develop really adequate range finders and optical measurement systems. Um, Virginia Artilleryman writes, Hi Indy, great work, love the show. 
My National Guard unit saw service during the Meuse-Argonne campaign, so I am curious, what role did reserves and other normally part-time forces play in the war? Did the various combatant nations employ them in different ways? Were any reserve units particularly noteworthy? Um, well, reserve units usually consisted of soldiers that had already undergone military service, but were at the time back in civilian lives. Most of them had to reckon that they were going to be called back into action one day if needed. And that day came in 1914. In the beginning, the British Army relied heavily on their reserves just to get enough men into the fight. And as the war went on, Germany as well as France had to activate all their reserves to replace their battered regiments. Notable actions of reserve units. Um, during the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914, there were a lot of German reserve units that were stationed in Prussia that held back the Russian advance and reinforced what were thin German lines. Um, and as the Italians entered the war, it was Austrian Landwehr regiments of old or very young men that dug themselves in high on the mountaintops of their empire's left and unguarded flank. They were outfitted with old guns, but they successfully used the terrain to their advantage, and they held out against vastly more numerous Italian troops while the main army was fighting in the east. Um, maybe the most famous American reserve unit was the 15th New York National Guard Infantry Regiment that would later become the 369th Infantry Regiment called the Harlem Hellfighters. You're going to hear a lot more about them as this show goes on. But we will, yeah, we'll make extra episodes about them, definitely. If you'd like to check out our episode when flamethrowers first made their appearance on the battlefield, you can click right here to see that. And you should definitely like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.